Welcome to our Columbia Business School Executive Education Session today. I'm Mark Roberts, Senior Associate Dean, and I'm really pleased to be here with Academic Director Moran Surf for this webinar on the AI revolution, five things to do today to prepare your organization for an AI era. Uh, Moran Surf is a leading voice in the adoption, implementation, and deployment of AI solutions, working with some of the leading companies on neural implants and AI integration, He's a sought after speaker, expert witness, and commentator on AI advances. Moran received his PhD in neuroscience from Caltech and has worked at the MIT Media Lab, as well as at Northwestern, NYU, and the Tel Aviv University. Moran is on the board of a number of tech companies and was ranked one of the 40 leading professors younger than 40. His academic research on advanced technologies is often featured in leading public outlets, and he's spoken at many venues, such as TED, the World Economic Forum, and Stream. At Columbia Business School, Moran directs our Center for Advanced Technology and Human Performance, and he also teaches extensively in our executive education programs, particularly on topics such as critical decision making and, of course, AI. Prior to his academic career, Moran was one of the founders of a cybersecurity company that he took from its startup phase through to IPO. Welcome, Moran, and now it's over to you. Thank you very much. I'm going to set the slides. Uh, I want to apologize first to whoever is uh, not had a full night of sleep. I tend to speak very fast, especially when it's on uh, video platforms like this. When I get excited, I'll do my best to not do that. But uh, you might have to watch the recording afterwards in half speed. I learned people do that sometimes when I speak. To go straight to it, I want to talk to you in the next half an hour about the AI revolution. And I want to suggest a few things you only need to do right now to prepare for it. And before I start with that, I'll just quickly show you three slides that I picked out of the many that we use in our programs to convince those of you who aren't convinced yet that AI evolution is ahead of us and that it's really going to change everything. The one that looks at the past is the one that I really like that just shows the adoption of AI in the last couple of years. What you see in this graph are various platforms and how long it took each platform to get to 100 million users. So on the right, you see things like Spotify that took 55 months or, or, or Telegram that took uh, 61 months. But as you move to the left, you'll see that TikTok took only nine months, which is already very short. But OpenAI, one of the leading AI platforms, took a little less than two months from the day it became kind of like an idea that everyone knew about to becoming one of the leading platforms with 100 million users. So that's looking at the past as a way to convince us that it's really something different. When you look at the present, just recently uh, a survey by BCG asked executives how many of them think about AI in different contexts, and 71% said that they plan to increase their tech investment in 2024, of which nearly 90% of the investments are in three things. One of them is generative AI. So right now, 2023 is already underway. Uh, we see a lot of companies that basically think of ways to implement AI in their products, whether they are tech companies or companies that do something entirely different. And if you look at the future, there are projections like that from many companies. This actually is a very conservative one from Bloomberg, looking at how much money will be generative AI revenue based in the next couple of years. This one looks at 1.3 trillion in the next uh, seven years. Uh, it's already suggesting that 2023 is 67 billion and next year is going to be double that and the year after is going to be double that. And basically, we're kind of doubling the numbers every year. This is, I should say, a conservative one. There are numerous companies right now in the space of AI that are already valued at more than trillion dollars uh, as individual companies. And the space seems to be ripe with more companies looking at that. Uh, a little look at uh, uh, a graph that I like to show for the sake of you being able to not see what's in it, is a graph that uh, looks at the AI companies uh, that formed in the last couple of years. And you see those tiny dots. Each of them is a startup company or a well-known company that now has an arm doing AI. This is, again, a graph that I have to update every quarter when I talk about that because it just becomes bigger and busier every quarter with more and more companies that now say we're doing something with AI. And the reason I know about this is that a number of those companies invited me in the last couple of months to suggest ideas to them. The boards wanted to meet someone who can tell them how to prepare for AI, 
they ask questions, what do I do right now? And what I wanted to do in the next 25 minutes is give you some of the answers that I distilled from many of those conversations. Essentially, if you buy into the idea that AI is going to be big and you say, how do I prepare for it? The answer is here are five steps that I think all companies, whether they are already in the process of adopting AI or whether they're thinking about it in the coming short term, need to do. The first thing I should say is that if you don't know where you are and if you're not sure that you want to do that, we developed a little thing that we call the AI jargon quiz. You see a number of the terms that are kind of running by the screen. We basically ask students who are interested in, in taking a program on AI to take this quiz and just tell us whether they're familiar with these terms or not. And I think that for many of you right now, if you're kind of not sure, this is a good way to assess your knowledge and see where you stand on those things. We put the link here and, and with the QR code, and we can also provide you the slides afterwards so you can spend time freely looking at them and kind of get a sense of what is the things I need to know right now. Those again change very frequently, but at least it gives you some sense of kind of where you stand. On the right, you also see what we call the AI scorecard. This is something that we offer uh, companies that kind of think of adopting it right now as a somewhat of a map or, or a path that they need to look into when they think of how they adopt it. And I'm gonna actually pick a few of the 38 ideas that we have in this program and go over them with you in the next couple of minutes. So if we're kind of trying to think of how to look at AI in the context of a company that wants to adopt it, the five buckets that I thought would be relevant today are the change, the data, the use case itself, how to de-risk the organization, and in terms of governance, what do you need to do? And I'll dive right into the first one. So AI is a new technology, and like all technologies that are new, there is a process of change management that needs to happen. Now here, of all the slides, this is the one that many of you are familiar with. If you have had a change that uh, required you to, say, adopt some social media technology in the last 20 years or change your organization to incorporate a different toolkit in the last couple of years, you've gone through this process. It includes all the things that you would think about an organization needs to do when they think of a change management, identifying the role models in the company that would spearhead that. Ideally, designate one person in the company who I call here the AI Tsar, someone who everyone knows she or he are the center point for every decision on AI and they know what's going on. Uh, mapping the relevant resources in the organization, mapping the relevant or existing tools that you have, uh, aligning incentives, thinking of what are you going to measure as a way to know that the transition is happening correctly? What are the KPIs? Are you going to increase uh, uh, speed or reduce costs or try to be more efficient? Who are the people that are going to be used? Identify the skills that you already have and the ones you need to actually adopt and essentially create some process to learn the new technologies that are going to be incoming and study the, the things that might change. Those are all not new. They're something that all organizations need to do every time they want to do something different. I just wrote one thing that I think is important, which is it's on steroids right now. If you're used to doing that over the course of many months or sometimes years, when it comes to AI, things need to be much faster. Everything moves a lot faster on AI. You saw the graphs of the uh, future projections. This is a very conservative view. Some organizations that adopted AI had to do it within quarters. Of all the things that I put here, I thought that the first one that I thought many organizations are uh, doing first, and it's something that helps them set the path correctly, identify one person who's be, gonna be the person that everyone in the organization knows she or he are the person that talks to. So if all of those things are gonna be on your menu, that's the one I would go with first. This one is not surprising. Many of you probably thought about it on yourself. Let's talk about the second one. The second one is uh, organizing your data. AI relies heavily on data. Uh, most organizations have data, but it's not AI ready. Uh, and the first step in most organizations is to get the data that you have already ready to be AI. AI basically takes all the data, ingests it, and comes up with new predictions about the future or new ways to organize it. For that, the data has to be AI ready, and there are steps to go through to get it. The easy ones are to look at all the data you have and see which data are already structured. You have probably tables and some numbers and text and images. All of those are AI ready on the get-go. You can just put them in one repository and start training models on this data and making it available for prediction models. That's the easy one. The hard things are things that are not structured. Most organizations have data that is in the form of ideas in people's minds or experiences or things that are not 
in tables like videos or, or voice recordings, all of those are data and they're extremely relevant if you're trying to build something that will take the knowledge you have right now and move forward. It's just that there is a step that needs to be taken from this data in the form that have right now to making them AI ready. Some of you may have heard of a project within a company called OpenAI uh, that's named Whisper. Whisper is a project that OpenAI did voluntarily where they basically created a tool that everyone can use that takes podcasts or, or audio files or YouTube videos and TikTok videos and videos and turns them into text. And you might ask yourself, why are OpenAI so generous that they make this tool for everyone? And the reason is that ChatGPT4, the current version of ChatGPT, basically takes all the internet as its data and uses that to make predictions. However, the internet pretty much was all used for GPT-4. And you ask the question, what are they going to do with GPT-5? There's almost no more internet. There's few more blog posts and, and articles from the time that they did GPT-4, but they need a lot more, not just a little more. And one of the ideas they realized is that if you want to make the AI smarter, you need to have a lot more data, and data exists in YouTube videos and TikTok videos, which is what Whisper is doing. It's taking all those videos, turning them into text, and then you can feed that into the AI models of GPT-5. I'm not sure if uh, taking TikTok is going to make the AI smarter or dumber, but either way, it's going to make it richer in data. And in that sense, you can benefit from those tools that many companies create that help you take data that is unstructured, making it structured. And I think that in that sense, there's always things that you need to do, like mapping all the data that's redundant, seeing if maybe different arms of an organization have the same data, and then you don't need to do it twice. There are things that you can do that have to do with just thinking of metadata. So besides the actual files, there are things that are helpful in creating organizations around data, which I listed here as a, you might want to tag data as, is it private or public? This will determine whether the AI can use it in records that are available to the outside world or on the inside. You might figure that data requires some tagging in the organization to which belong to legal or HR or finance because they will be treated differently. Uh, you might ask questions like, is the data synthetic, created by humans or created by machines? Whether the data source is something that comes from our organization or from clients or from competitors that we have access to, things that you might want to treat differently when it comes to your data. Uh, the data itself might not be complete and you might want to record that, uh, saying this data is complete, this data is actually missing or data that is imputed. We, we kind of took data that exists and we uh, created new ones based on that. And there are all kinds of levels of uh, precision that data has that you might want to record, like this data is 100% accurate, this data is not necessarily accurate and we need to think about it. All of those things that usually you would know in your head now become part of the data and the AI models can actually treat different data differently. They might say, okay, let's learn differently the data that is 100% accurate from those that are only, say, 10% accurate. And this now becomes critical to how you train things. And I wrote one tip that I learned from any organization that I think is relevant for a lot of people here is that not everyone calls the same data by the same name. So sometimes when I talk to organizations, I realize that one of the things you need to do is just create kind of a nomenclature that says, okay, when you talk about this, you mean that and when you talk about the same data you call it something else and this is how we avoid having all those redundancies so organizing data a second important step the third step is thinking of a use case now i should say that some organizations actually flip stages two and three they start with a use case and then they look at the data i learned that actually doing it in the order i suggested right now is helpful because when you organize the data you all start seeing the use cases either way you need to do both you need to know what data you have and also, what's a use case? And by use case, I mean is ultimately, what do you want to AI to do for you? And the way I go about that, and this maybe is one of the hardest steps because I'm basically asking you to think of a new product. It's innovation 101. I learned that it's useful to start with an insight you want, like a question you want answered rather than a technology. We have a cool technology. Let's do something with it. You want to say, what kind of thing I can answer that is interesting for me. For example, I sometimes think that I would love to have all of my emails arrive at my inbox already organized and prioritized by my preferences, not by someone else saying this is an urgent one, but something that knows all of my priorities right now and can say this email you want to look at right now, this one you want to look at later. For this, something needs to look at my data on my emails and sort them and know my values and my priorities and my schedule and look at the email that comes and does something with that. Now that you can follow a use case, it's easy to see what data you need. You need to know my emails, you need to know my, my schedule, you need to know the incoming email, the context, maybe the relationship between me and the other person. All of those things are ways for us to think of what's a use case and what's the AI. Now, 
to make it even more concrete, to those of you who say, okay, that's still vague, I will say that here's my advice to many organizations that come to me and say, we want to do something with AI, give us kind of concrete things. I usually say, think of two projects. One that I call a very kind of safe and sure project that makes money in a short run, that you know what you're going to do with, that is clear to you how to go about it, and one that some organizations like Nestle calls a legendary project, I would say a risky one, ambitious one. If you have two in mind, one that you say, this is the one that we know is going to work, and this is the one that we take a risk on, you typically have two teams that work in parallel to kind of go in different directions, but also look at the same vision. And I will say that the reason I kind of break those into two and I say start to use cases is that many times we ask what is and what we can do with it rather than what could be. To give a concrete example, I was fortunate enough to listen just a few uh, weeks ago to the CEO of OpenAI, Sam Altman, talking about his company in a very kind of friendly uh, afternoon. And he was asked by someone a question that I thought was a gift question. He basically was asked the question of the line, why are you so great? Or why is ChatGPT4 so great? And he actually said something surprising that I was not expecting. He said, it's not. I don't think it's a good product. And he said, if you asked me, Sam, five years ago, how I imagine AI would look like, I would not imagine a chat bot that you talk to a computer through. This is kind of what we resorted to because we have a lot of text, but this is not what I see it coming. I imagine it a lot more intuitive. You kind of think a thought and it translates into a, an action or you just say words and, and something interprets them. In a way, this made me realize that because OpenAI and many of the chatbots right now use text as a communication method, we all assume that all of the next steps would be a version of that. When I talk to companies, most of them say they want to create a chatbot. That's what all of them think. And I thought that this is a good chance for you to, at least for a second, when you talk about the missions project, to say, let's not see what is and kind of build on that, but really imagine how it would be. To give you an intuition of that, when uh, Sam and his colleagues are kind of starting to show what will be ChatGPT 5, you can see that they are moving away from text. These are examples of a project called Sora right now, that presumably is going to be part of ChatGPT 5, that takes text and turns it into videos. You see the, the prompts, a cartoon kangaroo disc, disco dances, or a, a little golden retriever puppies playing in the snow. Those are all prompts turned into videos. It's impressive, but also reminds us that you shouldn't just say what I have, how do I use it, but actually how I think it would work and what it looks like. Now, to make it even more concrete, I thought I'm going to give you a framework, or actually two frameworks from two leading people in the space on how you can actually think of projects. So this comes from an interview done by Bill Gates of Sam Altman. So two uh, founders of uh, companies that are very successful, and they both identified a framework that I thought would be useful for anyone listening to us right now on how to think of AI. So Bill Gates basically said one way to think of AI is in three steps, which is automate, accelerate, augment. And for every task in a company, you can think of how I look at tasks that can be automated and turn them into AI, accelerated and turn them into AI, augmented. Quick example, automations are the easy ones. Those are things that you realize quickly people in the company do repeatedly. And you say, okay, if people do it repeatedly, it means that there's a way to have AI learn from the past experiences and do the same thing. Those are things like interfacing with users, uh, chats, customer service things, personalization or customization. You may have heard of a secret project by Google that's called the on-demand internet, where they say if ChatGPT now or any kind of language model knows how to write code, we don't need to have an internet that exists. You can have an internet where there's a layer between the user and the website, when if you just type the name of a website, the language model stops in between and says, okay, the person wants to go to amazon.com. It doesn't exist right now, but I can quickly create it with a code, and then they see amazon.com, which means that every person would see an entirely different internet because the language models will know you, will know what you actually want, and will build websites for you. This is an automation project. You take a task people do all the time, and you say, how can I replace the entity that does it right now with an AI? Those are the safest and easiest ones. When you look at projects that you can do tomorrow, typically they lie in this category. Step two is acceleration. Those are projects that you know you can do, but you want to just make them faster. Uh, for example, one that I thought was, uh, is relevant and, and nice from Bill Gates is one where you uh, join a meeting five minutes late, happens to all of us sometime, and you don't want to stop everyone and say, hey, catch me up on what's happening. You want someone who was there before to just give you the brief, and that could be the AI, a friend of yours who listens to the meeting and just speeds up your catching up. You showed up late, 
someone tells you, whispers what's happening, and you caught up. That's an acceleration project. You take something that you could do, you just do it faster. And the most risky and the difficult ones, but the ones that are more ambitious and a lot of room for innovation there, are the augmentation project. You take human performance and you give it an aid, a co-pilot, a, a supporter, someone who can help there. Those are projects uh, along the lines of having, say, an agent advice in a business to business communication. So you're a salesperson talking to a client, you talk to them and they ask you a question and your AI sits next to you, listens to the question and says, hey, uh, John, you might want to say this or Sally, you might want to ask them that. These are aids to doctors who say, doctor, uh, you just heard the symptoms. I think we should go A, what do you think? And you can get a friend who can chat with you. Digital twins are the hallmark of those projects. You basically take your knowledge you download it to a machine and you can consult with yourself from the day before. In a way, those projects in this framework start with the easy one automation and go all the way to the augmentation ones are a way for us to kind of take all tasks and see where they fall. Sam Altman has a different take on that, but I think it's along the same lines. He said you can take all the tasks in the organization and break them into the time they take. There are five hours tasks, there are five minutes tasks, there are five seconds tasks. And the point of AI is to move the five hours to five minutes, the five minutes to five seconds, and the five seconds to zero. So intuition for that, uh, it takes me hours to create a deck like the one you're seeing right now for a presentation. A great way to use AI was to say, AI, look at the task I'm doing. It takes me five hours. Help me make it five minutes. So the AI will create the deck first, and I will just spend a few minutes looking at it and making tweaks. This would be a great way to take a project that will help me a lot. The five minutes ones, I might spend about five minutes writing an email. Uh, it would be great if the AI could know me and know my style and would write the first draft. And then I would need to spend a few seconds reading through it, again, making changes and pressing send. And if there's some tasks that take me seconds, those tasks like prioritizing emails, these would be the ones that ultimately AI can take over entirely. So those two frameworks I thought would be helpful to people who say, what can I do with AI right now as a way to think of use cases. And again, two tips that I learned from working with some companies on that uh, is that one thing you should know, there is no need to be the first. In many technologies in the past, we teach that here in business school, those who are first actually weren't the ones to reap all the benefits. Think of a uh, Yahoo and America Online compared to Google, who came second. Think of MySpace, who was the first, if you want, in the social networks compared to Facebook, or even browsers like uh, uh, Netscape or Mosaic compared to Chrome and Internet Explorer. The people who saw how it works out and came next didn't lose necessarily. So many of you can actually look at projects that exist right now and say, okay, now I know how people adopt it and I can do it better. In that sense, there's no rush to do it first. The other one for the CTOs, for the technical people in the room, I would say that one way to think of how to create technology is to ask the question, how does the brain do it? Like, how do I actually prioritize tasks myself when I look at emails? What do I think about? The more you are able to uh, see the process in your human brain, it will be easier for you to turn it into a computer brain. This is what I do often. The fourth point uh, is how to de-risk threats or the fact that you need to do that right now. AI isn't just a positive thing that gives us a lot of opportunities. It's also a risky technology that could change a lot of things negatively. And more and more leaders of companies need to be aware of the risks and know how they prepare for them. I wrote something that's specific and very kind of sadly relevant for those of you here who are senior leaders of companies. You will have to have a plan on what you yourself are doing when your character is being hijacked by technology companies, the creditors, or, or malicious uh, nations. There are more and more uh, knowledge about uh, cyber phishing attacks where basically someone uses your voice and the more public you are, there is more out there of your voice or your pictures. And basically criminals take your voice and they use that to call someone else. Uh, with only a few seconds of your voice, we can actually use AI to create continuous content as if you're speaking. What happens is that maybe someone calls someone else on the phone and says, I am Bill, the CEO of this company, and I'm kidnapped, and I need you to transfer this many Bitcoins to this account, otherwise I'm going to be uh, tortured. And uh, if you ask Bill questions, they know how to answer as if they're Bill. And turns out it's all an AI using your voice. It's your daughter calling you and saying, Dad, I need money right now because they're holding a gun to my head. Those sad experiences are becoming more and more uh, prominent. 
And this means that you actually have to have as individuals, the senior you are, plans to how do you deal with your character being hijacked, where your video appears doing something that you would not do and it hurts the stock price, uh, when you need to prove that you are you. Some uh, CEOs I know actually invent codes that they share with their family and say, when I call you and I tell you to tr transfer money, ask me this question and only the two of us would know that if I answer it correctly, it's me. Those are the things you need to start thinking about in a world where AI becomes a tool not just to do good things, but also to steal your identity. Generally, legal departments are going to have a lot more jobs uh, in the coming years because there are questions on IP that emerge from AI. Um, for example, many of the chatbots that exist right now use data from the internet to create the language model. With those data are things that are private, that were somewhere available and now can be queried by anyone and they can ask questions about your trade secrets or your IP. You need more and more of that. And even in the context of marketing, you will need to decide right now if you use AI as a tool, are you going to disclose it? Are you going to say it was made by AI or by a human? And I'm saying that because those are the questions that companies start to deal with. How do I think about that? You see a, a little a video on the right, and that's a video from a, a friend of mine. His name is Michael Armstrong. He's a chief marketing officer for Juventus, the a football club in a, Italy. And recently I met him and he told me that a few... A, not long ago, they had one of their star players, uh, 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 Giorgio Cielli, retire, and they made this little video with an AI uh, tool that kind of shows his shirt uh, coming up from the stadium with drones. It was it was a fun video that they did to honor his retirement, uh, and they used AI and they disclosed it was made by AI. And what they actually experienced was people actually dismissed it. They thought, oh, if it was an AI, probably took them five minutes. He said it took them uh, three days and three people to actually perfect the video and make it right, helping the AI do the rendering, but still making decisions. And in a way, he didn't get credit because it was made by AI. So now you have to decide how much you're going to actually disclose that AI is being used versus claim that it's done by you with the pros and cons of each of those things. Generally, I listed only two. There are many, many other risks that you have to think about, and organizations are now preparing for that, and we have an entire program dedicated to just explaining what those risks are. But I'll give you intuitions on some of the risks. We have the bias risk. AI only takes data that exists, the database, and builds on that. So if you ask an uh, AI program that creates images to draw an example of leadership, you get pretty much those pictures of a strong man, a, a man indeed wearing a suit. And this means that the data that we have right now predicts a little bit what we're going to have in the future. And if you want to change that, you have to know that your biases in data. Similarly, there are loads and loads of questions about plagiarism right now. There's a famous trial that New York Times is suing OpenAI because what you see in this picture are two columns. On the left is one that was written by uh, ChatGPT4 on the left uh, is one that was written by New York Times. I think it's reversed. The left is ChatGPT4 and the right is New York Times. And you basically see that because New York Times articles were fed into ChatGPT, you can ask it your question and get a New York Times article. And you would think that you're the creator of that, not knowing that it, you kind of stealing for someone else. This was done in text. This was done in videos, but in, in images, what you see here uh, on the left, pictures from the movies Iron Man and Dune. And on the right, uh, image that came out when a person prompted and says, create a picture from the movie Dune, okay, a picture from the movie Iron Man. The one on the right supposedly has no copyright. The person who invented it can say, it's my picture, but you can see that the AI very much stole everything from the original. Now you have a question, is it something that I can be sued because I stole Iron Man? Or can I say, no, I just put the word Iron Man in mid-journey in this case and got an image and it's not it's mine right now. And by the way, just to give you a, ta a taste of that, a colleague of mine uh, tried to ask the question, if I don't even use the word Dune or Iron Man, can I create existing pictures and claim their mind? And then I can say, I didn't even ask for Iron Man. I just asked for something. And the answer is yes. Here are two examples. Here's a prompt that says, give me a popular 90s animated cartoon with yellow skin and you basically get the Simpson. Or if you say, give me a man in robes with light sword, you get Luke Skywalker. So in a way, even without saying the words, you can steal an idea. And in that sense, we're now going into a world where copyright is becoming a very kind of fraught domain. Uh, you may have seen the lawsuit or the, or the negotiations and the trials and the strike last year from the Writers Guild of Hollywood that took months on topics like that. I predict we're going to see a lot more of those. In that sense, we're heading to a world where this is something that all companies need to have a view on. This is not just ending there. Uh, there are many companies that uh, 
had brand issues with respect to uh, how people use their product. What you see here is a famous picture that was popular on Reddit of the Pope wearing Balenciaga. Someone created this in Balenciaga. The, the uh, clothing firm had to deal with now uh, a lot of repercussions of the fact that someone essentially did something that made them get a lot of love from customers. Said, oh my God, if the Pope wears Balenciaga, of course I should do. But then at the same time, when the Pope said, it's not me, they had to deal with that. There are a lot of cases like that. Fake Joe Biden making robocalls and asking people to not vote. Uh, finance people who basically getting a video conversation with a deep fake that asked them to transfer money. And even some uh, uh, things in the domain of revenge porn that are now becoming more popular. The next year, election year in the US, we'll see a lot more of those. Both parties are now interested in looking at how to prevent it, but also how to use that. And it's the opening of a tough time for organizations, for leaders, and for many of you, if you're trying to kind of think of ways by which it's going to uh, affect your world, which takes me to the domain of governance. Generally, most uh, organizations will need to establish some kind of answer to questions on governance. Uh, a global AI alignment policy, if you don't know what it is, alignment basically is how uh, do you as an organization think of AI when it comes to society? What are the things where AI aligns with your values and doesn't? AI doesn't have yet values. It waits for you to assign those values. And sometimes you will have to make decisions that before were left for philosophers to ponder upon. And now they're going to be in your realm. Decisions like, you know, in the world of uh, cars, is the car going to risk the driver or risk uh, passengers if there's a problem? Uh, is kind of a classic one that many of you probably spend time thinking about uh, over a kitchen table. There are more and more of those questions. We call them the moral machine questions in, in our space, but there are questions that companies have to think about and now have an answer. And it becomes even more complex if your organization is global because you will learn that different countries have different answers based on their values. You might say that if you're talking the example of self-driving cars, in Europe, if you have to choose between taking a risk and maybe hurting the driver versus killing a passenger, people prefer to save a passengers that are more uh, kind of uh, younger and more, I think uh, the studies look at, I think females more than men, young more than old, uh, people with uh, lucrative professions more than not. And this is the view in Europe when it comes to what to do. The same company who builds those cars will have totally different priorities in Asian countries where elderly are regarded more and most people in preferences and surveys say they prefer to save, say, an older man versus a younger man. In those cases, companies will have to have views, not just like on an answer, but globally how they think about it. Uh, one suggestion coming from uh, Google's uh, former AI person, uh, Jeff Hinton, is that many companies might want to start by publicly stating what is the intended use of their model. So they would say, we're building a chatbot. We plan for it to be used for a way to help people find tickets, uh, flights and airline tickets better. Then if the AI goes wrong and starts uh, becoming racist or sexist, which happened to a few of those companies, at least you can say, look, this happened to us. We weren't intending for this to happen. Uh, and for this, you just have to state before what you plan to do. And then you can at least claim and hold on to the belief that you didn't want it to go this way. Uh, companies uh, like OpenAI are now uh, trying things like watermarking uh, GPT output, basically controlling the speed by which output comes out. So people could just look at text and know right away if it's coming from AI or coming from a human or using certain words in between that will mask that it's GPT, but will be useful for forensics afterwards. This will be a way to stop students from just creating essays with AI without even reading them. And there are projects that are now in the realm of governance trying to help organizations figure out where they stand and how they use those tools. Here, my one advice is that you need to follow the trends and get updates. Those things change very fast. They change very fast in each nation and organizations that need to adopt AI are also some, are also they, they also need to think of how they stand on that. And in that sense, I would say that any person who's looking at us right now isn't just a um, business person or a leader of a future companies or citizen, and you also have to form an opinion and inform an opinion on your approach to AI. You might say, you know, I make a lot of money if I go this way, but as a person, I don't want the world to go this way. So my governance and my policy would go differently. For that sake, I will say that recently we published a paper that asked the question, is AI an opportunity or a threat? And 
basically compare that to human decision makers. And we kind of came up with an equation that I thought would be a good one to, to leave you with, which all of you have to ask yourself, will I transition to using AI as soon as it's better than humans? Or will I ask it to be perfect? What I mean by that is if you're a doctor, for example, and you have evidence that on some conditions and some assessments, AI performs better than you. Will you just recommend to your patients to ask the AI for advice rather than you? Or will you say, I'm only gonna do that when the AI is perfect? In the realm of self-driving cars you spoke about before, uh, if we know that self-driving cars are gonna be safer than human driving, are we gonna just say now, immediately, let's stop human driving and move to all AI, or we're going to wait for them to be perfect and we're not going to tolerate one time when they're going to have an accident. Those are decisions that companies and leaders have to do right now, decide how they look at AI. I know I'm on time and I want to take three more minutes to do one thing you didn't ask me, but I thought would be relevant for a lot of you, and that is make predictions. Those are always risky and unfavorable, especially if you make uh, mistakes, but I thought that people would appreciate me making some predictions on where AI is going to be in the next year and maybe in the coming months. So I, I made a few of them and, and here's a kind of something you can hold me accountable. I, I, suggest, I said that I think that uh, in a year from now, if you would like, you will bring me here to speak about the interference of AI in the 2024 presidential election. It will happen the same way in 2016. Uh, afterwards, had a lot of follow-ups on how Facebook and, and Google and other companies in the Silicon Valley kind of ecosystem were somehow responsible for uh, problems with the election. 2024 is going to unfortunately have a lot of this AI will be uh, dominant and companies like the one I mentioned already try to gear up and prepare for that. But I think this is what's going to be on the menu next year. You'll also uh, uh, ask me next year to speak about how AI integrates with the brain. There are more and more companies. I'm a neuroscientist. I see brains everywhere, but I still think that the coming year is going to be a year where many of you too will see that AI isn't just a tech thing, but it's also an organic thing. And more companies are gonna to try to find ways to integrate that with your brain. Uh, some of you might ask me afterwards about that. There are already some companies looking at that. I predict uh, on the negative side that there's gonna be at least one major scientific, uh, sorry, on the, on the positive side, at least one major discovery in, in the realm of science made by AI, some drugs, some pharmaceuticals, some solution for a problem, some mathematical, uh, 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 equation that we couldn't prove ourselves that is going to be uh, attributed fully to AI. That's on the positive side. And on the negative side, I imagine at least one major AI crime on a large scale, either in the realm of financial fraud or a collapse of a banking system uh, that's that's done by AI. And to kind of take away from my very uh, you know immediate space and show to you that it's everything on the grab, I think we're going to see the first best-selling book written entirely by AI. Uh, if you ask yourself what you need to follow this year, uh, I wrote a list that you can have in the slide of uh, things that will become popular this year. There's a platform called Grok that is raising popularity, another, basically another AI platform spearheaded by the people of X. I think this will be a contender for a, a lot of like attention this year. Uh, of course, if you look at the investment in AI, I think the place to look is hardware. Uh, up to now, there are only a handful of companies that are dominating the hardware space and they're valued in the trillions of dollars. I think that the next year is going to have a lot of those companies that you'll see uh, election users, uh, companies that will realize that there's a lot of money in the election are going to uh, start creating tools for that. Of course, there are lawsuits that will help us shape the view of AI. There's a famous one by New York Times versus OpenAI. Elon Musk, a former investor in OpenAI, sues OpenAI, uh, whether they're open enough and that, those two lawsuits are going to be very public and they're going to shape a little bit how it works. Left field thing, the price of Bitcoin is going to fluctuate a lot. And because of reasons that we can go into later, it correlates a little bit with adoption of technologies in AI. In that sense, how it manifests in the next couple of months will be relevant. Generally, uh, looking at academia and how AI models improve will be really important. You'll see a shift from just chat to more physical com communication. So you have robots using AI, you have manifested objects using AI, neural implants, as I said, brain-controlled AI will be big and organic processing. Generally, the two industries that are very fast in adopting those things and are useful to look at are Hollywood and the gaming industry. They're far ahead, and they're the ones who I often look up to to see kind of how they adopt it. I hope this was helpful in giving you some clarity on things you need to do right now where you need to look into the future, and also some of the interesting things that are happening that might be relevant for you. With that in mind, I'm thanking you, and I'm giving back to Mark for the QA.
Thanks very much, Moran. Thanks for the presentation. And you've covered like a huge amount of ground in a very short space of time. So we really uh, appreciate that. Um, as you can imagine, we've had lots of questions coming in during the last half an hour or so. Um, so I thought if you could tackle maybe two or three of them rapid fire, just as we wrap up the, the end of the session, really. The first question that we kind of highlighted was, um, was this one. So in the future, what effect do you think AI will have on arts and artisans? That's a great one. So there's a, there's a quote that I <laughs> like using that says that uh, in the future, we wouldn't download music. We would download musicians. In that sense, AI is uh, doing one step further. It's not just kind of saying, okay, I can mix notes and, and make new ones, or I can take your preferences and pick from the existing ones. I can actually learn a style and create new things in this style. We can see the new Beatles, Beatles song coming out from AI. It learns Lennon McCartney and it creates a new one in their style that is really kind of capturing, captivating us the same way they do. In that sense, I think artists are not in a better place than a, academics, uh, authors, AI is coming for you too. Um, like many other fields, I would say that uh, artists who use AI probably have advantage towards ones who do not. And to an extent, I think that the one way I would say we can, we can all do better is an understanding that creativity is a process that we typically think of as two-step process. One is the generation of many ideas, and then it's the selection of the ones that are good between them. AI could be a useful tool for artists in generating a lot of ideas. It could give you a lot of like mod modulation of the same tune that you have in your mind, and then you can choose from it. It could help you uh, look at your kind of artwork in your mind first on a canvas that it made, and then see if you want to design that. I think AI could be helpful to artists in generating new ideas and giving them at least a chance to kind of start from a little bit of an advantage. Uh, I would say that artists generally, and this would be my last sentence on this, are also, they also need to be aware of those lawsuits that happen in Hollywood right now and, and the kind of the, the legal aspect of that because they will be probably uh, suffering uh, from those if they don't, if not right. I just learned that a few weeks ago, an AI chatbot or, or a bot uh, created all the options for all music possibilities and tried to patent all of them and trademark all of them. Uh, that's, uh, of course, wasn't on the menu, but it's one of those things that right now artists need to be aware of. Like, can I be kind of competing with my chatbot on my audience? So yeah, at least you do. It's kind of exciting and complex all at, all at the same time. There's so much going on. Thank you for that. Um, the next question is one that came up in many different kind of formats, but how do you think AI will change job profiles in the near future? So I think that I'm not going to surprise everyone by saying that it will change things. Uh, many of my students are right now uh, recruiting for jobs that I didn't know existed when I started uh, undergrad, uh, social media manager. Uh, uh, so the same things are going to happen with AI. It's going to eliminate a lot of jobs and it's going to create a new uh, set of jobs. I would say that one cliche that I uh, learned, or one thing I thought was a cliche when I was a student, of philosophy now I think becomes real. And that is that of all the things that people need to think about and prepare for when they get to the new world, uh, I was told learn how to ask the right questions it is important. Back when I was a kind of philosophy student, I thought, okay, this is such a cop out. Like, of course, asking the right questions is important, but like, actually, we want the answers. I think that now we know that asking the right question is actually critical because asking questions is what we call prompt engineering. How do you ask question of AI getting the answer? That's a real job right now. So there are going to be new jobs. Training algorithms would be a job. Prompting algorithms well. Those, those are real jobs that, that those of you who are right now ready for them will do well. And for almost all jobs, I think I said it in the, in the talk, but I'm going to say it in a clear sentence right now. If you can think of ways to use AI in your job, you'll do better than someone who's done the same job without AI. So if you're an ideologist with AI, you're going to have advantages over the ideologist alone or AI alone. In that sense, all professions that benefit from just knowing how AI works will do better. Okay, great. And then last question, if, if that's all right, is um, what are some good resources for a CEO who needs to explore AI further today? So I, I will give you two. Uh, uh, one, of course, kind of uh, giving our, our own uh, program a lot of nod. I'll say that academia generally is ahead of industry on most things AI. If you look at the uh, scholar uh, kind of list of articles about AI, you'll see that all of the things that are being adopted right now were developed and 
kind of conceived in academic papers sometimes in 2017, 2018. And in that sense, academia is a really good place to look at for what is going to come next. And for that, I say, if you kind of thinking of use cases, adoption techniques, and, and even algorithms, look at Google Scholar and type AI there and look for 2024 20, papers, and you'll see what's going to be in your kind of portfolio in two years. So the technical team in your organization, the leadership team, maybe would want to look there. And for that sense, plugging against our own program, we are academics who try to also have interface to the real world in the business school, and we created a program, one out of uh, numerous programs, they try to take the knowledge that we acquire in academia and translate it into tangible application cases. So again, plugging our own program, I would say we have some ways to kind of translate those knowledge in a very concise way. Great. Thank, thank you, Maran. Thank you for all the, the kind of knowledge, tips, kind of predictions um, and energy that you've kind of given us as we think about kind of AI. I'm sure we'll have you back to discuss more of this. I also wanted to wrap up by um, sharing with everybody that we're looking forward to your new open program, the business of AI that you're going to be directing um, in June from the 18th to the 21st of June in person um, on campus here in, in New York. And for everyone to know, this is a four day program and uh, participants are going to be discussing practical applications of AI with Moran. They're going to be looking at how AI can be used for decision making. And we'll also be considering during that program how best to integrate AI, AI within organizations. So, uh, Moran, thank you for investing in building that program as well. We're really looking forward to that. Um, and I know during that program as well, there's, uh, it's not just classroom stuff. So you're going to take people into real New York and into some companies and there's going to be panels and lots of interaction with people actually doing projects and running businesses that are AI led in many ways. So thank you for that. So um, great to have had your insights. Thank you for today. And thank you to everyone who's joined the session. Um, it's, uh, I, I'd just like to say thank you on behalf of Columbia Business School Exec Ed. Um, we hope that you come and join more of our AI sessions and particularly our executive education program and have a good day. Thank you. Thank you.